Right. Hi all. Um, this session is about entity validation or the API for entity validation. Um, so if that's not something you want to see, you're in the wrong room and you still have time to go to a different one. Um, so let's get started. Um, I usually start off my sessions with a couple of questions for the audience. So how many of you have um, worked with plugins in Drupal 8 before? Excellent, awesome. Um, how many of you have written a custom field or entity type? Wow, that's quite a lot. Awesome. So what most of what I'm gonna tell you guys is gonna make a lot of sense, so that's perfect. I've given this talk once before, a couple of weeks ago for a mixed audience and half the room is like, what's he talking about? And so, awesome, great audience then. So, let's get started. I am Christian van den Ende. I'm a Drupal developer. I work at Decent in the UK, but I work remotely. So I just live in Antwerp, Belgium. Well, close to it, at least. I'm happily married to my wife, Sylvie, and I always mention it just in case. I'm a highly sensitive person, which means that at any point in time, something in my body may trigger a panic attack or stuff like that. So if something does go wrong, it's that. Don't worry too much, it's usually fine. Um, so, yeah. Um, so let's get started. So what is entity validation? Before I go into my session, I just want to mention how I came about the creation of this session. It's, um, I'm the author of the group module and it's a really complex module. So basically I had to touch like every API in Drupal core uh, in order to be able to create it. And one of the APIs that wasn't really documented and that actually really amazed me was the API to validate your entities with. It's pretty obscure. There are like hints left and right in, in the code in core. Um, but in order to really get it, I had to like dig through the code, Google a lot. It really was hard to wrap your head around. So my idea was that I would create a session and tell you about my findings so that you don't need to go through all that pain and effort. So here goes. So entity validation is basically what you need to prevent this. We've all seen it a lot. It's really annoying, but we can all be thankful that we get these guides because if we wouldn't, then we would have uh, invalid data or code that could be crashing somewhere and we wouldn't know what's up because it was already too late. So thankfully we have exceptions, except this little guy shows up way too often. So you want to prevent that. So what the API in Drupal 8 does is it validates your content entities. So I'm guessing, given the showing of hands before, that most of you know what content entities are. It's like nodes, um, you know, stuff that your users can create. So it validates those, and it validates those on multiple levels. And when it does that, it returns a list of violations. Um, it always returns that list. It can be empty, meaning there were no violations, or it can have violations in them, meaning validation failed. It happens automatically in the entity form. So um, when, when you fill out a node form and you're doing something wrong, you get this error and it highlights the field that you know had invalid data. That's actually entity validation at work. It's the only place in core where you can really see it as an end user. Um, however, it's not a part of the form system. So it's being used in the form system. And this is the cool difference with Drupal 7. In Drupal 7, entity validation happened in the form system because it was the form system. There was nothing else. It was a validation handler of a form. So if you wanted to validate your entity outside of that, well, good luck. There were a few ways, but they were all really painful to implement. In Drupal 8, that's no longer the case. They separated it. So now it's a different API but it's just being implemented in the content entity form. So, and it guarantees the data integrity of your entities because, well, if you ask for your entity to be validated before it's being saved, then it will not save until it's valid. It's up to you, by the way, to handle those violations, but more on that later. So when do you want to use this? And that's actually pretty simple. Um, it's basically whenever you manipulate an entity. 
So there are a couple of examples, and one of which is REST, which is the most common one. So um, imagine this. You're not using that form that has that validation built in, but you're allowing people to create or update or delete, well, not necessarily delete, entities uh, through an API. Then how will you validate what they have sent to your API? It's, it's really hard to do that in Drupal 7, but in Drupal 8, it's really easy because we have that separated API. Um, also, when you have custom entity generation, uh, generating code, so when you generate an entity yourself, so for instance, you have some code that needs to generate a few default nodes, and then you want to set those as the front page or whatever, um, you can't always know for sure what field someone may have attached to that node. So if you call validation on that node and it gives you any violations, you know that you didn't provide enough data to have a fully populated node. Uh, same goes for migrations, stuff like that. Whatever you can come up with, if it involves manipulating entities, you probably want to implement entity validation. And it's actually really simple to use. So how do you invoke it? That's it. You just call validate on an entity and that's it. Or entities have fields. If you want to validate just one field, you get that field and you validate that. Or if you want to go even deeper and you want to validate one entry in that field, one delta, just grab it. It's really that simple, although you need to do something with that list of violations. So you, do, you don't just call it because, well, then you have Drupal telling you, yeah, there's some stuff wrong here, and then you're just ignoring it. So ideally, you want to save that in a variable and then do stuff to it. So how do you work with these violations? Um, well, first of all, checking whether there are any is easy. You just get that list and you call count on it because it's a countable object. So if it's zero, then you know you pass with flying colors. If it's not, then you need to do something. But it extends iterator aggregate, so you can loop over it and get all of the uh, violations. Um, there are some more funky methods you can use. You can get all of the violations that occur just on the entity level, or you can get all of the violations that occurred on a single field. If you want to read more about that, you know, slides will be available later on. You can check out that interface. Um, if you want to use a single violation, you know, in a loop or something, you can get the message from it, and that's just a human readable message that tells you what went wrong. So it can be something uh, like the username is not unique, something like that, and then that message will show up. Um, there's other methods too, like getting the property path, more on that later because that's pretty complex, <coughs> um, or, you know, getting the value that was invalid to get a better message yourself or something. If you want to read more about the single violation, it has an interface as well, as well, just check that one out. So where do these guys come from? So there are four levels of uh, entity validation. Um, you can validate the entity as a whole, and in order to demonstrate this properly, um, let me first sketch situation. So imagine there's four people standing in a queue. There's a lot of psychological quizzes like this that start like this, but imagine there's four people in a queue and they can only see the people in front of them. If you ask a question to the last one in the queue, it can tell, it, it can give you an answer about themselves or the people in front of them. If you ask it to the second to last in the queue, again, the people in front of them or themselves, but they don't know anything about the guy behind them. So that's how you need to imagine this. The higher level you invoke validation on, the more it can tell you because it knows more about what's coming next. If you invoke it at the deepest level, it only can tell you something about itself. So you can validate the entity as a whole. You can also validate a field on an entity. Now a field on an entity is, um, you know, the human readable, <laughs> uh, the human readable or, or human understandable way of expressing this. But for Drupal, a field is actually a list of entries, like you know all the deltas. But you'll see that in a second. So you can also grab a single entry of a field on an entity and validate that, or you can go even deeper and validate a property of that single entry. So um, in an obligatory car analogy, that would look something like this: you either validate a car entity, you validate the field wheels. You validate a single wheel in that field, uh, in in that field, or you validate a property like tire size of a single entry in that field. Um, in Drupal speak, it looks like this. 
So if you want to validate the entity, you're validating the content entity interface, actually the fieldable entity interface, that's where the validate method is on. But 99% of the time, you're using the content entity interface, which extends the fieldable entity interface. Um, on the second level, you have the field item list interface, which is the, the full field. One entry of that field is the field item interface, and then all of the properties below that are just type data interfaces. Now, there's a small lie in this slide, which you'll probably have spotted if you went to the session about type data. All of the above are also typed data interface. It's just easier to remember it like this. Um, so the four levels in detail. I'm quickly going to skip th uh, through this because it's just examples and I've got a feeling that this the, the audience understands it already. So when you're validating an entity as a whole, you're actually, because you know all of what's going on on itself and everything below you, um, you're, you can validate across multiple fields on that entity. That's why you want to validate on that level. So for instance, if you want to add a fuel tank and an electric engine to a car entity, you're going to have a bad time. So that's where entity validation is a good place to you know, throw a violation because it can tell what fields it has and then compare the values of those fields and tell you what's wrong. You can also do field independent uh, validation on the entity level because you don't necessarily need to look at your fields. For instance, if you're trying to save a third car uh, entity when you're flat broke, you should get a violation saying you're flat broke, please don't buy this car. Um, so that's all of the um, types of validation that you should do on the entity level. You can also do it on a field. And that's wrong, it's supposed to say multiple field entries. So whoever just pimped my slides mistyped that. Um, so it's validation across multiple field entries. So for instance, imagine that field with the wheels. If you want to add two monster truck wheels and two mini bike wheels to the same car, it's probably not going to run. So that's where you would throw that violation. When you are validating a single entry, you can validate across multiple properties. So again, the lower level. So for instance, if you have a wheel and it has a different rim size than a tire size, probably not gonna work. And then finally, at the deepest level, you can validate a property. So um, basically, if you have a tire made out of wood, you wanna throw a violation saying select a different material. So how do you define your own validation? Um, it actually needs two classes, but it's not that hard. So one of them is a constraint plugin. And this is why I asked you about the plugin system. So it's um, basically quite easy to define. You just need these guys, like a unique ID. Every plugin needs it. You need a human re readable label, not necessarily, but I prefer it if people add that because then you have an easy way of telling what it is. Um, it well, it doesn't really require a type. More on that in a second. Um, or a list of types that it supports. And well, like any plugin, you put it in my module source plugin validation constraint. Um, that's where you should put it. So it looks kind of like this. So uh, as you can see, it's, it's pretty empty. Um, there's just a couple of messages there. Those are being used by the validator. Um, and you'll see that the type key is missing. So what about it? Well, it's missing because core actually doesn't use it. Um, it uses it in one place, and that's the plugin manager. And that one, um, that one actually just allows you to filter the available plugins on a type. Like this plugin supports entities, this plugin supports field items, um, this plugin supports strings or whatever. It just allows you to filter, um, nothing more. Um, so if you want to apply one of your constraints, there's nothing stopping you from applying it to the wrong place. Um, because Drupal doesn't seem to use it. So if you still want to provide a type, if you don't, it defaults to an empty array, which means you can apply this to nothing, which doesn't really make sense. If you provide false, you tell uh, Drupal that you can apply it to everything. You can also be specific and say this constraint can only be used for A, B, C, or D. I'm going to shake my legs for a second. <laughs> I'm just feeling a little flushed. So this is what it looks like. So um, you've got entity and entity reference here, which basically means this constraint can be applied to an entity 
or a property of the entity reference field that actually references an entity. So they can also take options, which are completely optional. A lot of constraints don't take any. But if you want to, um, to have you know, uh, options, like if you have a constraint for length, you don't want to create a constraint that says, well, length 30, uh, 32, length 31. You just create one, and you allow it to accept an option that says, how long can this field value be? Um, you simply define them as object properties on your constraint. That's it. And you can accept any number of options as an array whenever uh, someone adds your constraints. How to pass those options is covered later. So accepting options. Um, so as you can see, there's this one option here. It's called type. And if, you, if, if people add your constraint and they just give a flat out value, um, Drupal will look for a default option. So you could add that constraint with nine, and it would map nine to type. It's just that as soon as you start accepting multiple options, well, then people will need to provide an array where the keys are the names of the options and the values are obviously the values. Um, so now we get to the validator class. This is the, um, the harder part, and this is coming from Symfony. So they have a magic class name. So by default, whatever you name your constraint, add validator to that, and that's the name of the class you need to have for your validator. That's the class name you need to have. But you can change it. You can change it in the validated by method that you can add to your constraint. And the reason you can change it is because there are good use cases for reusing a validator. Um, suppose we had that length validator, and the constraint that was implementing it actually had pretty non-descriptive messages. It's perfectly fine to create your own constraint with better messages that are better suited to your use case and just reuse that validator. Then all you had to do was write the same constraint and just change the messages. The value it receives, and this is important because earlier I said, you know, all of them are type data, but this is why I split them up because at this point, Drupal does some magic. I can explain that if anyone has questions about it, but it's too deep into core to dedicate session time to it. So basically, when you call validate on the top level on the entity, the validator receives a full entity. If you call it on the field item list, the validator receives a field item list. So, and it goes on like that. So it's really important to know where val uh, validation was called from or initiated from. Um, and one of those uh, things why it's really important to know that is because if you did specify a type for your constraint, you can be pretty sure what you're receiving. If you specify that it can only have entities, well, your validator can assume that it will get entities. If you didn't specify a type or it's a generic validator, then, well, you need to double check what you're getting, like check for interfaces or something. Um, there's one different, uh, th there's one small exception though. If you're validating properties, you're getting the raw value of that property. You're not getting the type data, you're just getting the raw value. So if you had a property target type for an entity reference field, it would just give you the name of the entity type. So in an earlier, like, uh, earlier uh, slide, we saw the username constraint. So as you can see, we just added validator to the name. It's automatically picked up. And the username constraint is applied to a field item list, so a full field. So as you can see, it receives items because there's multiple entries possible in a field. Um, yet the username field only has one entry. So further down the code, they just grab the first item and they start validating that. Why didn't they apply it to the first delta? Well, because it's easier to apply your constraints to a field item list than it is to a field item. You'll see that too. So I'm mentioning the next part for completeness. It's the property path. So it tells you, so suppose there's an error. It tells you where it occurred. So follow me on this one. So the property path defaults to the item being validated. So if you just want to throw an error from your validator for the thing that is being validated, don't do anything. Just throw that error. You don't need to worry about the property path. 
but you can be more specific. So suppose um, we started validation on the entity and at one point it went over a couple of fields and then it went into a field where there was an error. At that point, the property path has already been uh, populated with the name of the field because you started it at the entity, the last guy in the line. He said, well, I'm trying to validate the person in front of me and that person is you know, making noise, so something is going on. So that is already one part of the path, the person in front of you. And then that person can just you know, say that, well, yeah, it's me that's doing something wrong, so he doesn't provide the path, or, well, actually, it's the guy in front of me. So he provides the path to the guy in front of him. Um, there is an example of that in a very complex validator. There's few examples in core, but this is one of them. So if you want to check that out in detail, check out that class. But it basically, basically looks like this. So when you started validating from the top level and something is wrong with the first value of field foo, then it would give the full path to that value. But if you started validating from the field level, it would give you know, the delta and the property, but no longer the name of the field because it's already happening on the field. Um, validation is being invoked on the field. So the lower in scope you invoke validation, the shorter your property path will be. Again, you probably won't need this. I'm just mentioning it for completeness. If you write your own validator, that's really complex. You're gonna thank me for having mentioned this because it, it can be a real pain to discover that part. Um, so how to apply validators? And this is the most important part. We've seen what it is. We've seen why you should use it. So how do you apply it? Um, there are several ways to do it. One is in annotations when writing something that requires an annotation. The other way is by invoking um, the or calling the adds constraint method. And then finally, there's one tiny exception because, well, it's Drupal. Um, so if you define your own content entity type, all you need to do is provide a constraints array. And you'll notice that after the uh, equation, there's an empty array in the annotation. That's because I'm not providing any options. If you were to provide options, that's where you would do it. If you were to add a string, it would use that one option scenario, you would just map that string to that one property. If your uh, constraint has multiple properties, it would require an array with keys and values. So every comment entity is, uh, that is being validated will always um, call that constraint along with all of the constraints on its fields. Um, you can also alter someone else's entity type. Because, well, if you create them, you can manipulate the annotation. If you didn't create them, you can't. So how do you add it um, to someone else's entity type? Well, you just call add constraint. And it's like that for most of the uh, following use cases. Usually, you just call add constraint. You type in the name of, uh, name of the constraint, and then you add an array of options if they are required. So on the field level, so the field item list, it's the same. So when you are defining a content entity, you usually have what used to be called properties in Drupal 7, now they're called base fields. So you just add a base field and you call add constraint. And it, it's a constraint that applies to a field item list, well, it'll work. If you wanna do it to someone else's base fields or even bundle fields, again, you just alter them. Right, um, the field entry level, so one delta within a field item. This is a special use case. Um, so a single delta within a field item list is actually the thing that you define as a field type. So an entity reference field, a date field, all of them have this plugin for a field type. And if you wanna have a constraint that applies to every single delta of a field, this is where you would apply it if you create your own field type. If not, guess what? There's, um, there's a hook field info alter to alter someone else's field type. And then finally, we have that special little snowflake. Um, there's the field property level, the deepest level. The most common place where you will use this is not actually on the property, but it's on the field item list, which sounds weird, but it actually makes sense because this is the thing you use the most defining base fields on your entity type. So Drupal made it easy 
by creating a method add property constraints. And then you can provide a full array of constraints, each of them with their um, configuration that will apply to a specific property. Now, most fields have a value property, but there are more complex fields like entity reference fields. They have this target ID, entity, target type, all sorts of properties. If for some reason you want to uh, validate any of those, you can by adding a property constraint. That's where you'll use them the most. So, which is why, again, we have hook entity base field info alter and hook entity bundle field info alter if you want to alter someone else's entity types base fields. Um, but if you want to apply it to the property itself, so if you are defining your field type and you are defining the properties of your own field type, then again, it's just add constraint. So this is that special snowflake. If you want to do it on the base field level, you add the property constraints. If you are defining your own field type or altering someone else's field types, uh, property definitions, you can do it there and then it's just add constraint because then you're just adding constraints to a typed data thingy, as you can see by you know the data definition create call there. So um, that's it. I hope that made sense. Um, I, I, before I go to questions, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question that was asked when I was dry running this session in Ghent, which is actually a very good one. Um, people asked me, like, so we have this API, and it's being invoked from the form system. So why isn't it on by default? Why, if I call it, I still have to work with the violations? And that was a really good question. The reason it's not on by default is because Drupal can't possibly know what to do with violations. Whoever decided to create a constraint had speci a specific reason in mind, and Drupal can't guess all of those reasons. So uh, the way it uses that is it just says, well, we need to have validation in the form system, but outside of that, it's perfectly fine to save an entity without it being validated. Um, if I have time left after questions, I'll show you the code that's doing that because, well, to most people it doesn't make sense that you can save entities without them being validated, so you really need to call it yourself. That's the message I want to bring across. Don't expect it to happen automatically. Do it yourself. So uh, before we head to questions, join us this Friday. I'll be there. So if you have any more questions ab about this talk, if you have any more questions about the group module, about Decent, just you know, find me and I'll be happy to answer them. So now, does anyone have any questions? The mic's up there, by the way. Yes. Yes, do me a favor and walk up to the mic because then I can hear you better. Um, and I don't have to repeat the question then, I think. That guy has finished, so. Um, what is the solution for uh, status codes and uh, specifically for <coughs> for a REST API if you want to uh, detect the error, but if you don't want to parse the text, the text to find the error. <laughs> Sorry. Did you, did you get that? Yeah, so the question is, what do you do for status codes? Um, well. Basically, that is not up to the Entity Validation API because the Entity Validation API just validates the entity and it should always be the same status code when validation fails, but it's up to you to provide a good message. So you have a status code when you do a puts or an update, uh, a puts or a create. Put, uh, fuck it, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not that familiar with HTTP codes. So, um, but. What what you, what you do have is when you return that status code that says invalid data provided, you can specify your own message. And that is where you just grab that violation, you call the get message method, and that's what you ship off. And then it's up to them to deal with it. Uh, but specifically with the REST API in core, uh, the entity validation, the, er the error that they pass, it's really, it's not necessarily the message that you want to show to the users, but if you have a mobile app or something like that, um. Yeah, okay. Um, in that case, I would recommend the thing I said at the start of the session. Um, it, it requires you to swap out a constraint, but if you really want those messages to make more sense for a user, just add your own constraint that uses the exact same validator and swap them out. Just replace the original with your version that has better uh, error messages. But what if you have like uh, different kinds of uh, error validations that 
uh, you want to detect if it's specifically which type of error it was? Um, yeah, it just gives you the list of all of them. But seeing as you get that list, um, there's more methods on, on a violation, by the way. You can see what it was that failed, what, what constraint. So you could probably call one of those method, uh, methods and check for the constraint that failed. So you could do that in your code. I just showed the most common use cases, which is just getting the human readable error messages. But there's more you can get from a violation too. And then you don't have to compare the error messages. You can compare other stuff that's, that makes more sense from a developer's point of view. All right, thank you. All right, anyone else? Yeah, walk up to the mic, please. Awesome. Can you also remove a constraint? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, I only showed the add constraints, but I'm pretty sure there's also a remove constraint method. Um, I would advise against it because there's almost always a good reason why they are there. But if you want, yeah, you can remove them. Um, the session's goal, though, was to ensure that after you leave the session and start implementing this, it would guarantee your data integrity. And what you just asked me is actually, you know, the other way around. <laughs> so, um, uh, if you alter the behavior of an entity, it can make sense to remove a constraint. Yeah, in that case, you can remove it. Yes, <laughs> it's perfectly possible. You can remove it because when you call add constraint, it just actually adds it to a protected array inside that class. So I can't imagine there not being a method to remove it. It should definitely be possible. So oh, yeah. So you can get the whole list and then remove it from the list and then set the list minus that one item again. Maybe the reason there's not a remove constraint is because it doesn't, well, it's like, you know, it should have this big ass label saying, be careful when you go down this path. So maybe that's the reason they didn't add it to discourage people from doing it. But there are valid use cases. And as, you know, the friendly person at the up front just mentioned, you can grab the whole list, remove one item, and just add the list back. But then you need to have access to the code that it's val that's valid. Uh, no, so there. No, sorry? Then you need to have access to the code that calls the validate method. Um, well, yeah, you always, so you always need to be at a point where you can add a constraint in order to remove a constraint. But you can do that to anything, as we've seen, um, because if you're defining your own stuff, then it's really easy. But you can alter an entity type. You can alter a field type. Um, you can alter an entity's base fields. So you should be able to get to that point where you would normally call add constraints, but in your case, remove a constraint. So there is a method to remove constraint. No, so there's no method to remove it, as um, this person has just looked up, but there is a way to get the full list, which will give you all of the constraints that are currently on that item, and then you can manipulate that list, but there is a method to also set all of the constraints. So you're basically overriding the original list with your version of that list that has one fewer item in it. Okay, I think I get it now. Okay, if you want, um, you know, come up to me after <laughs> and I'll show it. Um, okay. So, anyone else? Hey, um, when you create a constraint validator, yeah. there's, um, you call add, so if there's something that's failed, you would call add violation. Yeah. But that applies to context. Do you know, or would you be able to explain what the context is? Is it ever used in Drupal? Yeah, so um, that context, I didn't mention it, um, but I did implicitly. It's basically what I said when every validator already knows where it's at. So when you're validating a field item list, it already knows that it's at that field item list. So which is why I mentioned you don't need to um, you don't need to populate that um, property path yourself in most of you know most of the use cases. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 um, the context is basically the thing that tells your validator where it's at. Um, if you want to specify your own property path for some reason, you can also use that context and then go from there. Instead of add violation, you call build violation, but then you need to specify a lot more info. You need to uh, invoke the adds, uh, add path method to tell you know where, where it's at. It's more complex, but there are examples in core. But generally, you just call 
add violation and it does all the rest for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be honest, I never evaluate evaluated the session before. So if I have zero evaluations, I'm not going to be mad at you. Um, but if you do feel generous and kind, please validate it. It's my first time speaking at uh, DrupalCon, so I was actually really stoked and psyched um, and nervous. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, let me know what you thought. Um, so thank you. <laughs> and And now a very shameless plug. Uh, we're hiring, but also we have these cool t-shirts now. And uh, my colleague, Ash, up front, has a couple of them. So if you want one of these t-shirts with that little rocket on it for the future of work concept, um, just contact him. Um, you know, first one gets one, I guess. Um, so if you're interested in working remotely, for a UK-based agency or working from the UK, if you're interested in a mandatory five-week sabbatical, or as I was just telling my colleague, I took a nap before this session. If you're interested in being paid to take a nap, come talk to me, all right? <laughs>